Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Thibaut Francois, so I'm working as technical consultant as, uh, at Odoo, <laughs> and I'm mostly a backend developer. So I'm here to talk about uh, the developer tool of your browser and explain you why, even if you're a backend developer, uh, this is probably one of your best friends. Uh, to convince you, first I will have a short introduction. I will explain very uh, lightly the Odoo architecture to see why this is important. Uh, this tool is really interesting. Uh, of course, I will present the tool, but I guess most of you uh, already know it. And finally, some practical case to show you uh, how easy uh, it can be uh, to solve problem with this tool. And of course, a conclusion. Uh, so why should you care about uh, the browser developer tool as a backend developer? Uh, since you know you have your own tool uh, to get information, you can put a PDB in the code, you can read the log, you can print everything you want in Python, you can even go in the database in SQL, you, the traceback has no secret for you, and of course, you can read the Python code. So basically, you know exactly what Odoo is doing uh, when the transaction starts. But, but usually, we forget about the initial condition, actually the parameter you get uh, from the request, and since Odoo is a complex framework, sometimes you also miss what is the real output for uh, the web client. If you remember uh, the infamous API 1, it was returning a list of your result, not your result. Okay, and the developer tool, of course, gives all those information. So, about the Odoo architecture. Uh, you have, we have two kinds of users with Odoo. We have the internal user that uses the web client, and the web client is a single page application, and all of the call making the server is asynchronous call. So you won't see anything in your address bar. Uh, the external user on the website, uh, they're making asynchronous call, synchronous call, it depends. Uh, everything is handled by a dispatcher that will dispatch the right controller. Of course, the controller, they will use a model. The model uh, use the ORM to talk to Postgres. You know already about it. So, if you are a backend developer, you work with the web client most time, most of the time, and you have 100% of asynchronous call. You don't see anything in the address bar. If you zoom out in uh, on the, the controller, of course, on the website, you have all the controller for application, home, shop, uh, blog, etc. But for the web client, it's always the same, and they are available, most of them are available uh, in this file. And the good thing, about them is that uh, if you interact with the model, it's always a data set controller class uh, that take care of that. And they get always the same parameter, the model name, the method, and of course the argument of the method as parameter. So you will see in the request basically which method is going to be called uh, in your Python code and with which parameter. Okay, so let's present the tool. How to reach it first? Well, it's Pretty simple, you can press F12, like this. Uh, and of course, there is a menu, more tool, blah, blah, blah. Uh, <laughs> but the good thing about this tool, a really good thing, it's available everywhere. I mean, it's available on laptop, but also on your business analyst laptop, on your customer laptop. So if someone showing you an error, you say, okay, just open your browser debugger tool, and let's see what's happening. And since it's client side, you don't need to touch your server, so it's safe on your production server. You don't need to access it, you don't need to read the log. Um, you don't need to, of course, stop, stop it to put some print or debug point. Um, it's very really great. Okay, so we have many tabs. The first one is uh, the element. You see the DOM, the CSS. Uh, it could be interesting for us when we put some HTML in our view, but it's mostly for web developer. <laughs> okay, so the console, you can try JavaScript code, but as backend developer, you don't like JavaScript, you don't know, maybe JavaScript. Uh, <laughs> so you don't play a lot with it. But it's great when you put some breakpoint, but once again, for web developer. Uh, the source, uh, you get the JavaScript source. Sometimes you cannot read it, uh, but if you want to add breakpoint, it's the place to go. And don't forget one thing with Odoo, you have to add debug equal assets, otherwise you just see the mimify version of the JavaScript and you are not able to see anything. And the last tab, 
well, there is more, but the last stuff I'm talking about, uh, is the nest war. And it's exactly what we need. It's all about the request sent to the server and the response of this server. So let's check it in detail. First, remember, everything is asynchronous. So 99% of the requests that interest you, they are asynchronous, and you can filter with XHR here. Uh, you won't miss a lot of information. Of course, you want to preserve the log in case of your reloading the page or you, are, you have a redirect or something else happened and the log disappear. Uh, with that, it never happened. And you can always clean your log with this button. <coughs> if we zoom on one request, of course, we have the header of the request. We have the URL of the request. And since it's RPC call, the most interesting is the payload of the request. Uh, in the payload, we will see in the parameter the model, the method, uh, you have the args, which are the argument of the method, and the kawargs. And if you're a Python developer, this should be ring a bell. Uh, and in the kawargs, you have always the context. It's easy to recognize it. Sometimes it's also in the args, uh, but you always recognize it with the lang and the time zone. OK, of course, we have the response of the server. Uh, the preview is nice because you can, it's sparse, and you can uh, fold and fold uh, part of the answer. Uh, once again, it's really interesting to see okay, what the server has responded to the web client. Uh, there is the timing. If you are talking about performance issue, if you have a spin and in the loading page, you don't know what is happening. Since there is a lot of call at the same time, uh, sometimes you don't know exactly which uh, transaction is uh, causing the problem. And here you can, have, you can see all the timing of all uh, transactions. And the most important about backend performance issue is the time to first byte. It means how many time the web browser has to wait um, to get the first byte of information. If you have content download that take a lot of time, the problem is not the server, it's your network. <laughs> okay, and you have some useful inf action you can do with your query, uh, your transaction, sorry. Um, you can, of course, copy some information to make uh, further analysis. You can replay it. You can copy a score, so you can replay it in your shell. Um, so that would be interesting if you're, especially if you want to test performance issue and trying to see how much time it's taking. Oh. Okay, so let's see the practical case. The first case, uh, I need to develop something. I want to automate uh, the invoice creation from a say order. Basically, what I need to automate, it's I go on the server, I click on Create Invoice, there is a wizard that pops up, I fill it, uh, and then I click on the button Create Invoice on the wizard. So as backend developer, the first reflex, we read the view, we see, OK, the button is calling this method on the server, and you read the code, etc. It can take some time. If you are used to, it can take 5 to 10 minutes. If you are not used to, it can take a few hours. <laughs> And you need to know, OK, since it's a button, I know I read the view, etc. So you need a lot of knowledge to know where to look. But there is another way. You can actually look what uh, the network is telling us. And this is what the network is telling us. Well, there is one missing the load of the action. But then when the wizard pop up, you have first a default get. Uh, then you have an unchange trigger by the default get. Then I fill the form. I have another unchange. Uh, finally, when I click on the button, three operations uh, happens. The creation of the wizard, the web client read again the information, and then it's finally calling the button. So you see there is a lot uh, of uh, requests happening, and, but we know in which order we have to call them. Let's see each of them in detail. Uh, the default get, well, always the model, the method. The argument is the list of fields uh, for which you want um, the, the default value. And of course, you have the context. You have always have the context. I just show you the interesting part. Since we are dealing with the wizard, uh, the active ID is really important. So we will have to take uh, care about those. And as a result, of course, you get the list of uh, the field and the default value of them. We'll be able to use this value for the create. OK, the unchange. Unchange is a bit complicated because as backend developer, we never use this method directly uh, since it's a wrapper to call the, 
the function, uh, the compute field, and the unchange in the right order. So basically, what uh, the web client is sending, first the list of ID. In this case, it's empty because the record does not exist yet. Then it's sending the state of the object, but from the web client perspective. So if you have changed something in the form, it will be sent to the server. Finally, you have the list of field and the list of field that has been touched. In this case, this field has been touched. And in this specific case, the result is really interesting. It's empty. This means actually you can completely skip uh, the call to unchange. And for both of them, it was empty. So it's really nice. Something we don't have to do. Uh, okay, the create, of course, you know about it. Uh, just the method. Of course, you have always the, met the, the model and uh, the context. But here, what is interesting is the value pass uh, to the server for the creation. Mostly, is the default value plus what I have changed. And as a result, we get an ID. This ID is really important because we will need it uh, for the call button. And the call button, you see the argument is the name of the method. And here, you, need, you see which method has been really called. Um, the ID of the record, and finally, the context. And once again, since it's a wizard, it's really important to take care of the context. OK, what have we uh, learned from this case? Well, implementation become really straightforward. You know which uh, method to call in which order. Um, it only took two minutes. Just reproduce the scenario in your browser, and you all get all the information. And you don't need to read the code to start your implementation. But if you want to read the code, you know exactly where to look. So this is really great. And it's easy to understand the workflow of the web client. You don't know how to read the JavaScript, but at least you can see, OK, the web client is doing this, 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 and this. OK, another case, interesting. Uh, the dem search is the method that is called um, when you are looking in the menu to one for some record to set uh, the value of, of this menu to one. And here we are in this, on the serial order line. We set the product, and then we want to set the unit of measure of that product, of that line. And we got only two results without typing anything. And there is, I know there is 19 records in my database. This is weird. Of course, you think about there is a domain. But there is no domain in the view. There is no domain defined in the field. So there is something happening, but I don't know where does it come from. So once again, let's look at the network. Of course, we have an unchange when we change the product. And then we have the name search uh, when we are looking for our unit of measure. And if we look the name search, this is the parameter that has been sent to the server. There is a domain. We don't know where it comes from, but at least it explains why I got two results. And we always forget about that, but the unchanged can return the domain. So if we look at the unchanged on the product, it returns a domain. And of course, in this case, it makes perfectly sense because you don't want to use units of measure that are not in the same category as the default unit of measure of your product. But if you want to change that, you know at least where to look. It's in the unchanged, not in your name search. OK, a third case. Uh, this is an old one, which is not necessary anymore, but I like it. Uh, <laughs> You want to add a domain with a many-to-many. -many. Basically, you have a field user ID, and you want to, to have the user only able to select a few of them. So you have a compute many-to-many -many with user, and say so you can only have a user from that list. So naturally, you will say ID in the list of user. This is in the view. OK? So once again, you are going to type. You have a name search, and you get a trace back. It has been fixed since, but in V10, you get a trace back. <laughs> So once again, let's look at the network. And you see something really interesting. You don't get the list of ID in your domain. You get six folds and the list of ID. Ring a bell. Yeah, It's the many to many command. So it's saying, please replace the current list of ID with this list of ID. So we got information, but not properly formatted. And this is the solution become straightforward once again. Just get the first element of the list and then the third one. And this is working in V10. Don't do that uh, in V30. And the last case, uh, it happened also. Uh, you open the CRM app, and you lead to a spin. It's spinning, and it's loading. You don't know why. Uh, this is a database with a lot of opportunity. So uh, probably it's 
because you have a lot of opportunity to read. It's a common view, making a lot of um, search read for each column. But let's check the network. And actually, this is what's happening. This is not uh, the search read or the read group. It's a read progress bar. This is something that compute the value needed for uh, the progress bar on top of each uh, column. So if you were looking at reading uh, CRM lead, it's not actually the right uh, program to spot. You know exactly with this where to spot and where to start your in investigation. Um, so in conclusion, no, I'm sure you are convinced that this is a really great tool, even if you're a backend developer. Uh, because it gives information to start your investigation very quickly. For debugging, for understanding the behavior of your wizard, of the web client, uh, for spotting performance issue. Um, and the really, really great thing about it, you don't need to touch your server. You can access it from everywhere. So if someone can reproduce the issue, you can check on his laptop directly. Okay, let's see what is going on. And you can do it on the production database. Of course, if you create invoice uh, <laughs> to test, you will mess up your data, but you can always clean them later. Uh, so, but it's not a silver bullet, as always. Uh, it gives a few information uh, to start your investigation, but it's always worth the shot. Uh, it takes only one minute to get the information, and after that, you can start your investigation with the right information. Um, well, so if you have any question, I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I think not in the documentation. So uh, probably there is somewhere, but it's changing all the time. If you look at uh, Olivier Denis' performance talk from a few years ago, uh, you have also um, scheme with architecture, but it always depends on the point of view you get. Here it was from the code point of view, but sometimes you have from a uh, you know, component point of view, so it's always complicated to say there is no one uh, architecture <laughs> scheme, but you know, there is not really good uh, scheme. No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>